the Gospel of Isaiah, chapter 19. If the Lord will enable me, I want to show you a picture of salvation God's way. That's my subject, salvation God's way. God never does things the way we would. And God never does things the way we think he should. Now that's a mouthful itself. If we'd learn that, we'd learn a lot. God never does things the way we would. And God never does things the way we think he should. This is what he declares in Isaiah 55, verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Never is that fact more evident than in the way God saves sinners. Search the pages of history all that you can. Search the writings of philosophers and of religious philosophers. And when you've searched all the countless forms of religion invented by men throughout history, you will never find any mortal who ever dreamed of such a salvation as our God performs. Never in all the pages of history did any mortal ever dream of a God who saves sinners the way our God saves sinners. First, the scriptures make it abundantly clear that he who is God saves sinners. The only people he saves are sinners. I know we teach our children erroneously, falsely, to their detriment, to their harm, perhaps to their damnation. Good boys go to heaven, bad boys go to hell. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. God only saves sinners. And until you find yourself a sinner... You will never know God's salvation. Christ Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God sent his son into this world to seek and save that which was lost. Christ came here to save sinners. He has mercy on folks who have need of mercy. Nobody else. Nobody else. God not only saves sinners. But he saves whom he will by his own sovereign choice, taking salvation altogether out of the hand of man so that man makes no contribution. Man has no choice in the matter. Man makes no decision to determine who's saved. So, but wait a minute, preacher. A man must come to Christ, must believe on Christ. Yes, he must. But he can't and he won't. And he couldn't come to God of his own will, even if he wanted to, unless God wills to have him. God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. He has compassion on whom he will have compassion. And whom he will, he hardeneth. And he doesn't give an answer to any man who asks the reason of him why. He never gives an answer to any man. I know preachers do. Preachers try their best to make God acceptable to men who refuse to bow to him. And they offer all kinds of arguments and speculation and theory as to how this is so. God never once answers the cavils of rebels. He just declares who he is and demands that we bow. God saves sinners by free, unconditional grace without any contribution from the sinner. Find any religion like that in the world. Find me any like that except the gospel of God's grace. God saves sinners by free, unconditional grace without the sinner bringing anything to him. 
without the sinner contributing anything, without the sinner performing any works. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But that's not all. God saves sinners by the sacrifice of himself. by the sacrifice of himself. God stepped into humanity. God became a man. God came here as a man to save men because there's no other way to save men. God came into the world in the humanity of our flesh and lived in perfect obedience to God's holy law as a man for us. What a God. What a Savior. No one ever dreamed of such a thing except as it's revealed in this book. The Lord Jesus Christ, God, the Son, took on himself our nature, our humanity, and obeyed the law and the will of God in perfect righteousness on our behalf to bring in everlasting righteousness for sinners who had no righteousness. And then he took our sin and made it his very own and hanged upon the cursed tree under the just wrath of God's holy fury, justice and law and suffered all the terror of an angry God to the full satisfaction of justice for sinners. God saves sinners by giving himself, by sacrificing himself in the place of sinners. By the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, God, our Savior, sets himself before us as no other God men have ever made. No other God men have ever imagined. No other God the mind of man has ever conceived. None of the works of men's hands that are called God are such a God as he is, a just God and a Savior. A just God and a Savior. God saves sinners only on the ground of perfect righteousness, justice, and truth. He won't save sinners any other way. God saves sinners using the instrumentality of sinners, like the one talking to you right now, to preach the gospel of his grace to sinners who need his grace. What a God. He, he has ordained by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But, Pastor, what about man's faith? God saves sinners. I'm talking about God now. I'm not talking about the little peanut men called God. I'm not talking about the God you whittled out of a tree stump with your pocket knife. I'm talking about God. God saves sinners by faith. Faith that only God can give. That only God can create within a man. Faith which God works in you by his grace, graciously reconciling sinners to himself who gladly give themselves over to Jesus Christ the Lord in free reconciliation because God gives them faith. This is salvation worthy of God. This is God's kind of salvation. This is is salvation God's way. God's salvation. Salvation as it's described in this book. Now, I've got to say something negative to make emphasis of the positive. You go to any church around here, any of them, I don't care which one you go to, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Episcopal, whatever you go to, go to Pentecostal, go to any of them around here, and listen to what they say about salvation. 
The salvation they talk about is not fit for God. For it's salvation that centers in you. It centers in man. It's determined by man. It honors man. It magnifies man. It exalts man. It's not worthy of God. But God's salvation is worthy of God. It is altogether like God. And as we experience it, sinners saved by the grace of God find that God graciously proves himself exactly as he declares himself in Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. When God saved me, <laughs> nothing was the way I thought it would be. Nothing since that day has been the way I thought it would be. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now this fact is beautifully illustrated in the 19th chapter of Isaiah's gospel. Now let me give you a tip about reading scripture. When you read the scriptures, it must be read literally as it is written, if you're honest. We don't try to make scripture say what scripture doesn't say, or go to a passage of scripture and just say, well, uh, this is what I think it means. That's, that's handling the word of God deceitfully and irreverently. What God speaks in his word is literally true. Now, this is not a book about science or history, but whatever it says about science and history is exactly according to what's written in this book. It's been proved over and over and over again. But as you read the Old Testament scriptures, if you would understand the scriptures, you must read the scriptures not just with a carnal eye, with carnal understanding, but with a spiritual eye, with spiritual understanding, as the scriptures are experienced by God's free grace. So that everything we read in the Old Testament scriptures, all the historic facts of Old Testament scriptures, are given by God to be an allegory of that which is spiritual. If we would understand Isaiah's message in this chapter, we must understand the spiritual meaning of what's written here. Egypt and Assyria were Israel's most ancient and most relentless and most cruel enemies. Throughout the history of the Old Testament, nobody despised Israel. Nobody more greatly abused Israel. Nobody more thoroughly sought the destruction of Israel than Egypt and Assyria. As we read the burden of Egypt given here in Isaiah 19, it's obvious that God purposed, deserved judgment for both Egypt and Assyria. He was determined to bring great misery upon those nations. But when we get to the end of this chapter, we see a very strange thing. Egypt, Assyria, and Israel are all standing together as one. Egypt and Assyria, one with Israel as the Israel of God. Because God has his elect in all the nations of the world. And Japheth shall possess the tents of Sham, just as Noah prophesied back in the book of Genesis. They all stand together, all enjoying the blessings of God's covenant grace in everlasting salvation. Obviously then, God the Holy Ghost here speaks by his prophecy, or by his prophet, with prophetic words about this gospel day in which we live. Let me show you four things in this chapter as we read it together. Number one, we find first here the Spirit of God reminding us of a fact. Brother Lindsay read about it back in the office just a little bit ago in Romans 7. Salvation God's way. 
delivers his Israel out of Egypt. But he leaves Egypt in his Israel. He delivers his Israel out of Egypt. But he leaves Egypt in Israel. He delivers his elect out of the world. But he leaves the world in his elect. He leaves his people in this body of flesh to live in this body of flesh. God speaks here in verses 1 through 10 of certain judgment, the shaking of his hands upon Egypt and Assyria. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. He's talking now about judgment coming upon his people as they experience his grace in this world. They first experience his judgment. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. And they shall fight every one against his brother and every one against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof. And I will destroy the counsel thereof. And they shall seek to their idols, to the idols and to the charmers and to them that have familiar spirits. They'll turn this boy and that. And to the wizards and the Egyptians will I give over to the hand of a cruel Lord. And a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord, the Lord of hosts. And the waters shall fail from the sea. And the river shall be wasted and dried up. And they shall turn the rivers far away. And the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brooks shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax and they that weave networks shall be confounded, and they shall be broken in the purposes thereof. Everything they purposed, everything they planned, every scheme, everything on which they uh, leaned for help, every prop, every defense, every security, every rationality, every wise guide, everything they'd held shall be broken. All that makes sluices and ponds for fish, everything destroyed. War, strife. Turmoil, bitterness, famine, thirst, pestilence, waste, failure, everywhere. And when God comes in mercy to any people, to any man, to any woman, the first thing God does is strip away every refuge and every confidence and every security and every hope you have. And that's the way it is with us still by nature. The burden of Egypt falls upon our souls whenever the Lord in his wisdom remits the outpouring of his spirit upon us and leaves us for a little while to ourselves as he puts it in Isaiah 54, when he, in a little wrath, forsakes us for a season. When he hides his face from us. When he does, we find the rising of sin within, the remainings of indwelling corruption bubbling up in our souls. And there is darkness, felt darkness, even like the darkness God sent upon Egypt in judgment. 
Our spirits fail within us. Our hearts sink. And like Jeremiah the weeping prophet, with weeping heart and eyes we cry, My strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Every saved sinner knows by bitter experience. He may not put it in words just as I'm about to. He may not say it just as I say it. But if you're saved, if you know God's grace, every saved sinner in the world knows by experience that saved people are people with two natures. God didn't have to do it that way, Lindsay. He did it that way on purpose. If we're born of God, we live Adam living in us and Christ living in us. The old man of flesh, corruption and sin. And the new man created in righteousness and true holiness. The old man of darkness and rebellion. And the new man of light and reconciliation. The old nature, which is nothing but sin. And the new nature, which cannot sin. That which is born of God, which is righteous. And that which is of the devil, which is evil, sin, and corruption. And God graciously makes us to know that by day-by-day -day experience to make us ever know that salvation is by grace, not by our works. To make us ever look away from self to Christ Jesus the Lord. Brother Rex read out here in Colossians 1 of our being reconciled by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus the Lord. And now we're delivered from the dominion of sin. Now I've studied that for years. What on earth is that talking about? Delivered from the dominion of sin. Most people have the idea. That means that uh, if you're saved, you don't have the same problem with sin you used to have. I ask any of you here who can honestly say that's the case to stand up and tell me right now. That's just not the case. That's just not the case. Well, I don't get drunk like I used to. I know alcoholics who've never known God who don't get drunk like they used to. Well, I, I, I don't smoke dope anymore. I've known folks who were dope heads who got off dope because they realized it cost them too much and they quit smoking dope. They don't know God from Billy Goat. That doesn't mean anything. Well, I, I, I don't uh, go to the bars and hang out at honky talks like I used to. Well, sometimes you've got to grow up. Some folks don't, but sometimes you've got to grow up. And folks just quit acting like they did when they were teenagers. Uh, it's not talking about no longer having uh, sin trouble. The fact is, Mark Medley's sin rages in you today like it never has before. We hide it. We don't act it out. But it's there. That ugly, hideous, vile, evil, monster sin is what you are by nature. You and you and the one you're looking at right now. That's what we are. What's that mean? Sin shall not, not have dominion over you. I no longer dread the judgment and wrath of God because of sin. The shaking of his hands in judgment no longer terrifies me. I've been delivered from the dominion of sin, the fear of death by faith in Jesus Christ the Lord. And I cry with the apostle, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And when I do, I cry with confident, joyful faith. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord, deliverance is sure. And look at verses 11 through 17 and learn this. When God comes to save, the first thing he does is create terror in the soul. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. 
Zoan was a small little town in Egypt. The council of the wise counselors of Pharaoh has become brutish. The wise men, the wise things of the world have become brutish like wild beasts. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I'm the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Where are they? Where are thy wise men? Let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The wisdom of this world suddenly becomes foolishness. The princes of Noth, the word actually is Memphis, city of idolatry, are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt. Even they that are the stay of the tribes thereof. These are the backbone and strength. They seduced Egypt. The Lord did this. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof. And they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof. As a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. That's a pretty good description of what my life was outside Christ. That's a pretty good description of where you were when God found you. Like a drunk man staggering in his vomit. Neither shall there be any work for Egypt which the head or tail, branch or rush may do. What are you going to do for God? Suddenly you made to see you can't do anything for God. In that day shall Egypt be likened to women, and they shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. As I read those words, it is as though I'm reading exactly what happened in my world when first God awakened me to a sense of my sin and the dread of divine wrath terrified my guilty conscience. The terror of guilt suddenly realized. I had known all my life that I was a sinful man in the sense that everybody knows they're sinful. I'd done things wrong and uh, liked it. I'd known all my life things I did in my rebellion were evil and wrong and I uh, would suffer the consequences. I, I was aware of that. And then one day, God's commandment came. And I had a horrid sense of guilt. Not before mom and dad. Not before the law. Not before school teachers and principals and authorities. But a terrible sense of guilt before God. A terrible sense of guilt before God. Such a horrid sense of guilt before God, I thought it would drive me absolutely insane. And with that came a terror of a sense of righteousness required by God. I didn't know the scripture then, but our Lord said, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What can I do to make up to God? And I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. I tried correcting this part of life and that. I tried going to church. I tried being religious. I tried reading my Bible. I tried praying. I tried being a better young man. And nothing could I do that would ease my guilty conscience. There was no work I could perform that would satisfy my conscience, let alone God. 
I could not do good. I could not do righteousness. And I had a horrid terror of judgment at hand. The wrath of God abides upon the unbeliever. He doesn't know it. He's unaware of it. Oh, if you knew it, you couldn't live with it. But when God comes and awakens in you a sense of sin and guilt, I won't pretend to explain it theologically or know how it transpires or how it fits in theological systems. I'm just telling you what I know. When God comes and awakens in you a sense of guilt, a sense of judgment, you find the sword of God's justice swinging over your head and hell is at the next breath and you're terrified to meet God. And then in verses 18 through 22, the sweetest thing in all the world is described. The sweetest thing in all the world to a poor, helpless, guilty sinner is the revelation of our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In that day, in that day when all hope is gone, in that day when you're guilty and justice is grabbing for you, hell is gaping open for you in that day, shall five cities of the, in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. This, this place where destruction has been, this place marked for destruction, suddenly speaks the language of Canaan. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. An altar, a pillar, a sign, a witness to God in the land of Egypt, in this dark, dark world. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. And as soon as they cry, he shall send them a savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Mark every word of these verses. How sweet the promise is contained in them. In that day, this gospel day in which we live, this day of Christ, which Abraham saw afar off, in which he rejoiced, Egypt had been miserably spoken of before, but now everything is mercy. So it is in all the transitions from nature to grace. The language of Canaan is the language of the gospel. Egypt here partakes with Israel in the mercies of redemption and speaks the same language as the children of promise. God's altar, Christ Jesus, our altar, is set up in the world, in this dark, dark world. Here, here is Christ, our altar. And God's people standing as a pillar, a witness to God in this dark world, worshiping Christ, our altar, and the Egyptians. You and I converted out of the darkness of heathen idolatry, throw down their idols and bow to the Lord of hosts. And as we do, poor needy sinners, under the conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment, pray. And as soon as the needy soul bows in prayer, God sends a Savior, a great one. Brother Larry Chris preached to us on those words of the angel concerning our Savior, he shall be great. Oh, a great one he is, the great God, our Savior, who with great redemption obtain redemption of our souls and eternal salvation for us who gives great sinners great hope by his great grace. 
a Savior, a great one, and he shall deliver them. Let me give you another passage along the same line. Turn over to Zechariah chapter 12. All of this comes to pass in the gospel day of grace because our king, the Lord Jesus, exactly as Joel said he would, pours out the Holy Ghost upon all flesh. Look here in Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Yes, even those gathered out of Egypt and Assyria. I'll pour upon them the spirit of grace and of supplications. And this is what happens when God pours out his spirit upon needy souls. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. As you know, we don't practice the evangelistic trickery and deceit of our day. I would never tell you how to pray or what to pray. I'd never tell you say this and say that to God. But if ever God pours out his spirit on you, you won't need me to tell you what to say. If ever God pours out the spirit of grace and supplication on you, you won't need somebody to tell you how to pray. He will cause you to look on him whom you pierced. Look at chapter 13 of Zechariah, verse 1. In that day, when God pours out his spirit upon you, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Christ the fountain, the Savior, the great one, opened to all God's elect in the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Syrian and Egyptian for sin and for uncleanness. Back here in Isaiah 19. This is God's method of grace. This is salvation God's way. He smites that he may heal. Look at verse 21. The Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. I'll, I will perform my vow, the psalmist said. I'll take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And the Lord shall smite Egypt. And he shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. Now I keep saying this hoping you'll hear me. You will never know the love of God in Christ until you're made to know the wrath of God without Christ. You'll never be saved until you're lost. God will not robe you with the righteousness of Christ until he strips you of your own righteousness. He will not heal you until he has wounded you and you have need of healing. He will never Lift up until he cast down. He will not make you alive until he slays you. Again, referring to what Brother Rex read to us in Colossians 1 about reconciliation. There's only one way to reconcile an enemy. Now you can bribe him off for a while. You can hire him as a friend for a while. You can... Uh, uh, hold him in such bondage that he's not in any danger for a while. But there's only one way to reconcile an enemy. You have to absolutely destroy him. You've got to absolutely destroy him. And then having destroyed him, be so gracious to him, so kind to him, so beneficial to him, so merciful to him, that he can't Resist your grace. And it turns to you in gratitude. That's how God reconciles his people to himself. He wounds. 
that he may heal. He strips that he may clothe. He abases that he may lift you up. He lays you low that he might take you up in the arms of mercy. He slays that he may make alive. He destroys you. Every hope, every ounce of strength, every refuge, every confidence, everything on which you rely, by which you hide from him, he destroys you that he may be gracious to you. Oh God, do that for sinners. Do that for sinners as only you can. Now, in verses 23, 24, and 25, here is a highway home for poor sinners. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrian shall come into Egypt. And the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day. Now listen. In that day. Israel shall be the third with Egypt and with Assyria. What? Oh yeah. When God saves sinners, reconciles sinners to Christ, he reconciles them to one another, and they walk as one, one in Christ Jesus. Israel shall be third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Oh, wondrous, wondrous grace. God takes such things as we are. <laughs> and makes them a blessing in the land where he's put them. Until God saved me, I injured everything I touched. I had no relationship I didn't harm. I brought evil to everybody I influenced. Everybody. Everybody. And then God took this Egyptian, this Assyrian, and planted him in Israel. And wonder of wonders makes this man a blessing to others. That's what he does with every sinner saved by his grace. And he puts him on a highway. These whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel, my inheritance. Now you know who the highway is. That's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And the Lord God declares that walking in this highway, Egypt, Assyria, and Israel walk together. They are God's blessed people. They are the work of his hands. They are God's Chosen inheritance. And they, being saved by God's free grace, blessed of God with all covenant blessings in Christ Jesus, are made of God to be a blessing. <sighs> I am more and more overwhelmed every day with that promise, that covenant promise of God made to Abraham. He said, I'll bless you. And I will make you a blessing. What grace. What grace. This is salvation God's way. This is salvation worthy of him who is God. God make it yours for Christ's sake. Amen.